Okay, so uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Sasha Racklin. Uh, uh, he he, uh, he sent some uh, very generic uh, title, a few connections between optimization and probability, but I see that he changed his slides. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, uh, um, pleasure to speak here. This is actually kind of a continuation of the, uh, uh, the boot camp uh, talk that I gave in September. Um, I will describe this Burkholder method, which I think uh, um, should be more widely known within the communities of uh, uh, online learning and, and the optimization community. Um, uh, and, but let me first motivate, and let, let me say that this is ongoing work with uh, Dylan Foster and Karthik Sridharan. Um, <clears throat> let me first provide the motivation for this uh, problem. Uh, the motivation is online supervised learning, so we have a very um, a generic uh, a prediction problem, prediction task that lasts for n rounds. At, at each round t, we observe some side information xt. Think of this as a, a, a vector or a matrix. Uh, we make a prediction, a real valued prediction y hat t, and then we observe the outcome yt. And so what we would like to do is we would like to have a few mistakes or a small number of errors accumulated over and rounds, and so that's gonna be measured by the following regret inequality, so let me decode this. Um, uh, on the left-hand side, we have a, a cumulative error that we uh, incur over n rounds, and what we would like to have is that it's not much more than uh, the minimum of the kind of the linear explanation of y from x, so the, the fit to data uh, in hindsight, and I'm using absolute values rather than square loss for simplicity here. Um, and um, uh, so that's the first term. If, if indeed the sequence that will come has a good explanation of y from x in terms of a linear prediction, then this term is going to be small. Um, and uh, uh, there is another term that um, uh, adapts to the difficulty of the sequence. So some sequences, uh, and this is just a function of the x's, are difficult. And so we would allow more error on those sequences, and some sequences are nicer and would like uh, fewer errors on those sequences. And the key property here is that we would like this result to hold for all sequences. We're not assuming any generative process on the data. We'd like the method to be robust uh, with respect to any misspecification uh, and, and have it for all sequences, okay? So it's not clear that this is even possible, but uh, it turns out that uh, uh, a kind of a, one can develop methods that uh, uh, enjoy this inequality for all sequences. Um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> without, without um, explaining too much, let me just say that the best uh, uh, measure of the difficulty of the X sequence in this case is what's called the empirical Rademacher complexity. So given the covariates X1 through Xn, you form, you look at the norm um, without specifying what the norm is, the norm uh, of the sum of these uh, uh, vectors or matrices multiplied by random coin flips, random, co uh, random signs, right? So this measure somehow, somehow measures the spread of the x's, if you wish. Um, and one can show that this is the best one can do in this setting. Uh, an easy lower bound shows this. Uh, um, one example that I would like you to have in mind is matrix completion. So this is a case where both W and X are matrices. One by one, you're predicting entries of a matrix. Uh, in this case, XT is just the indicator. It's a zero matrix with an indicator where you need to make the next prediction. That's the side information. You make the next prediction, Y hat T, you observe the outcome. And at the end of the day, you're hoping that there is gonna be a low rank or a low trace norm explanation of the observed outcomes uh, um, um, uh, given by some low rank or low trace norm matrix, okay? So, so CN should technically depend on F as well? It will not depend on, uh, oh, on, on this F. Yeah. Yes, yes, so I, I didn't write it, right. F typically is going to be some kind of ball in some space. Um, you can also make CN depend on W, but this is not what we're gonna do, but Typically, you could, you know, genetically, you could uh, go into that uh, in, into that direction. Okay, so um, uh, um, okay, so, so the question is: Is this possible? That's the motivation, right? Is this possible to obtain uh, this bound? And let me also say that if you get this, um, this is like a ninja bound. I call it ninja bound because 
if uh, at the end of the day you, you actually do have IID data, X, Y, Z, or IID, then if you just average the trajectory, then you get the optimal result in the IID case as well, because empirical Rademacher is the optimal bound for the problem of prediction with uh, uh, absolute value loss, right? But here we're trying to get it for all sequences, not just uh, for IID sequences. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, kind of, what do you do? Well, kind of, the the, the first thing that you uh, try to do is you turn to online complex optimization. You treat this as a some FT of uh, vector W. And now, if you're making proper predictions, these are predictions that are based on some uh, uh, estimate WT that you keep updating over the rounds. Then uh, uh, you can think of this as FT of WT. And now this becomes what's called an online convex optimization problem. You observe these functions FT coming, and, and, and uh, uh, you, you make a, a, a gradient step, typically. Now, what kind of CN can you get if you do gradient descent? Then, uh, well, um, if, if you do gradient or mirror descent with an ad ad adaptive step size, then what you can get is a square root of the sum of the squares of the gradients, right? So this is a, a bound that depends on the actual sequence of the, of the functions. And of course, for our case, that's just the uh, 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 norms of the x's, right, squared. Right? So what you can get with this result, with uh, gradient descent or mirror descent with adaptive step size, is square root of the sum of the squares. Now, if you look at uh, uh, the, the gap between what we want, and, and uh, which is the Rademacher averages, and uh, the square root of the sum of the squares, you, you observe that uh, there could be a huge gap, right? In the L2 case, where this is a Euclidean norm, there is no gap. From the kinchin kohane inequality, the, these are up to constant tight. But in different geometries, uh, there could be a, a huge gap. And in particular, if you do uh, a matrix completion and you uh, replace the rank with an appropriate uh, trace norm bound, uh, this one is meaningless. This bound becomes meaningless because you're essentially taking every entry and, and taking a norm of that matrix, right? So there's a zero matrix with just one entry on, and uh, uh, a norm of that is just going to be a constant, so you're paying for every, uh, every time step. And, and here, this is a spectral norm in that case of a random matrix, and that has a much nicer behavior, uh, and it has a behavior that's driven by you know, the, the, the spread of the x's, how, how the sampling is done for the matrix completion problem. Okay, so the question is, uh, how do we fix uh, this issue? It, it seems like the gradient descent cannot give us the result that we want. Right, let's hope. Yes. Yes, but uh, uh, it's a product of the uh, so so. There's rows and columns, uh, and if you replace the rank R constraint with an appropriate trace norm constraint, it's going to be square root of the product of the dimensions. And you get another square root of the product of the dimensions from this. And so the, the CN becomes just a constant. Or, or grows linearly with the product of the dimensions of the matrix. So the question is how to fix this gap. Whether there exists a method that gets this bound instead of this bound. Uh, and uh, what I would like to claim is that um, so I, I know that Alexander Madri is giving a talk that uh, gradient descent is the mother of all algorithms. I'm, I'm going to claim that, the, 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 uh, well, maybe there is a father, but the, it, it's not, uh, it, 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 it's not going to be enough for our purposes. Somehow there, there is a fundamental uh, difficulty with gradient descent or mirror descent um, in, this, in, in that it's not keeping the right statistics about the sequence that it observes, right? That's, that's the claim. Um, uh, gradient descent or mirror descent, so we know that it's parameterized by a strongly convex function. You take a, you t you, your geometry is given by a norm, and that now you come up with a strongly convex function with respect to that norm. Uh, then you define a Bregman divergence, right? And then you, that gives you the mirror descent, right? So the, the basic primitive in this construction of mirror descent is a strongly convex function, right? So strongly convex function is the geometric notion that you're exploiting when you do gradient descent or mirror descent. And the claim is that you need a different geometric notion. The question is which one? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, th this is what I said. We need inf additional information about the geometry of the functions, not just the size of the gradients, which is what 
mirror descent keeps in, in, in memory, but uh, the, uh, somehow they're spread of the gradients. Um, and the question is, can we go beyond the usual notions of smoothness and strong convexity? Um, in, the, in the TCS community, I know that there is a lot of work uh, applying first order methods to a variety of problems. There has been a lot of progress. Uh, by using the right geometry, and, and, and hopefully ideas from, from this Burkholder method can be also uh, translated into, um, in, in, into that setting. Okay, now we would be searching in the dark for the right geometry notion, uh, for the right primitive, if not for the following connections, which I think are fundamental, and so even if it doesn't really make sense, I will try to at least uh, sketch them. We start with the problem of online prediction. And then when we go to the minimax dual for that problem, when we write it as a, as a, as a, as a two-player game and we appeal to the Van Neumann minimax theorem, we, we get a, martingale, a certain set of martingale inequalities that we need to certify. Um, this is something that we started with Peter Bartlett in, in uh, 2009, I guess, 2008. Um, what I would like to talk about now is uh, a connection between martingale inequalities and geometry. And once we understand both this connection and that connection, uh, we will be able to go back and use the geometric primitive for online prediction. That's kind of the overall goal. So there, is, there's a, uh, there are two fundamental connections here. <clears throat> I will not talk about this one. I will just talk about the Burkholder connection. OK, so let me describe the Burkholder method. And if you want more information, things can get very difficult very quickly. Uh, my goal is to present the simplest possible uh, explanation to the point that you'll probably say that it's trivial. Um, if you want more information, uh, here's the, uh, a very nice book by Adam Osikowski, who is the expert on this subject. Uh, he has written many, many, many papers uh, and many expositions of the method. Um, and what we would like to do is just to adapt some of these ideas to our setting in the simplest way possible. Okay, so let me introduce a little bit of the notation. Uh, epsilons are IID Rademacher coin flips plus minus one, 50-50. Uh, FT is just going to be the sigma algebra generated by the first uh, T or random coin flips. And X is a martingale different sequence with respect to this filtration, this dyadic filtration. So the, the expected value of xt given the ft minus 1 is equal to 0. And uh, just a side note, uh, any, of this, any dyadic martingale of this form can be written, in fact, as a epsilon t times some function of the past coin flips. right? And, and, and that just follows from the fact that it has to be 0, and there are only two possibilities, because epsilon t takes on two values. right? So conditioning, conditioning on these epsilons, there are only two possibilities. You can always write it in this form. Okay. These are martingale increments, the martingale differences for some predictable function xt. Okay. Any questions? Please stop me if something doesn't make sense. Okay, so we talk about martingale inequalities. What are these martingale inequalities? Well, we can write one genetically, very genetically, uh, as some function b of the martingale difference sequence of length n and just say that the expected value of this b is less than 0. So this covers a lot. Uh, when you choose the right b, you get a martingale inequality. Right? Choose your favorite b and try to prove this. Or if you observe some martingale inequality, you can convert it into uh, the, this form. Right? I'm going to abuse notation, and a b will, uh, will, will, will have a different uh, size inputs. Right? So it's just a function from the union of the x to the n for all n, right? So this should be for all n. Any questions about this? So here is a statement. Uh, I, 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 we're writing this up, but you know, this is really the Burkholder method. So there, there, there is just specified a little bit uh, to our uh, setup. Um, the, the, the result is that one holds, that's a martingale inequality, it holds for all martingale different sequences and all n if and only if there exists a function satisfying certain properties. Right. So uh, already at this point, you should, uh, uh, you should start wondering why this is possible. This is a statement in probability and expectation. And this is a statement about existence of some function. And the claim is that from this existence, 
we can uh, deduce certain geometry that we need to use. Okay. The, 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 this function will satisfy properties that I will describe in a second that will induce certain geometry. So here you're trying to characterize the class of functions B, right? For which the uh, B is given. B is given. And uh, this holds for all martingales, even only if there exists some function U. All martingales is the property of the function B. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. Exactly. OK, so what are these properties? Uh, first is the property that connects U to B, and it's just a domination. So U is larger than B, that's all. Okay, that's the only connection between U and B. The second one is U of the empty set, because it takes on different uh, length inputs. U of the empty set is less than zero, so that's kind of a shift condition. And the third one is the mo most important one. If, if you take any inputs and then you uh, average over the, in the last coordinate over xt and minus xt, remember xt can be vectors or matrices or whatever, um, uh, it has to be upper bounded by U of the, you know, with one less, uh, uh, element. Okay. So these are the th three conditions, very, very simple conditions, right? And the claim is that uh, that holding for all martingale different sequences is equivalent to existence of a function with these properties. And in particular, if you can get a hold on a function with these properties, it allows you to prove that inequality. So in particular, if you can dream up a, a function or find it using SOS or whatever you want, with these properties, uh, you've proved a, a martingale inequality that could have been possibly difficult to prove otherwise. Okay. Any questions about this statement? Um, the proof is actually very simple. So let me do the easy direction first. Uh, suppose that you have a function u with all these properties. Well, this one is the domination condition. And now you repeatedly apply the third condition, which removes the coordinate one by one. And then you end up with u of the empty set, and that's, above, uh, that's upper bounded by zero, right? So there is no difficulty here. Just a slightly more difficult is the other direction. And this is where Burkholder's uh, contribution comes in. He recognized that if you defined u using the following definition, then it satisfies the properties that uh, I've listed. Okay. So this requires just a few more steps, but it's also not difficult to prove. So what, what, what is this, this definition? You want to find u of some length input x1 through xt. The way that you're going to define it as a supremum over any n up to which you go, and any martingale difference from xt plus one to n. And now you look at the expected value of b with this uh, 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 random continuation, right? So essentially, the way that you define the u, u function, uh, uh, the optimal u star function, is by a random continuation, right? Think of this as a, uh, a random walk, or I don't know, this makes some kind of smoothing of the b function, if you wish. And so there might be some connections to uh, um, in, in that direction. Okay. Uh, and it's not difficult to, I'm not going to show it, but it's not difficult to show. It's just a few lines. Okay. So what's the supremum with respect to? Supremum is with respect to uh, all lengths n. These are the random continuations. Are you taking a supremum of all possible martingales? And all possible martingale. Martingale different sequences. Sure. Which one is the one you, you're going to be using most? Both? Uh, which one we're going to be using which, for which directions? directions? Is the most difficult for which uh, well, both actually. Yeah, we're going to be using both. Right. Yes? Can you give an example for the function B? I will give two examples. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the first example will be the one that we'll uh, cherish and love, which is a strong, strong convexity, right? as a consequence of this. And the second one is this other statistic that you need to keep in, my, in memory to get the Rademacher bound that I enjoyed. Good. Okay, so uh, 
easy to show that u star is the smallest function that satisfies this. Even though it's defined as a supremum, it's the smallest function that satisfies these three properties. And the first two are trivial. The only thing to check is the third one. And indeed, suppose that you have a, a, a well, this is just the, you have a u prime function that satisfies the condition. This is the, uh, what was the first condition, the dom domination condition. And the, this is the third condition. And because the u star is defined as the supremum of the left-hand side, uh, you've got the result, right? So that's uh, easy to check. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to, to make it as trivial as possible. Okay, so now we come to examples. Example one, smoothness and strong convexity. It turns out that the inequality that corresponds, the Martingale inequality that corresponds to strong, uh, to, to smoothness, I should say, is this inequality, right? So what, what is this? This is a random walk. You measure the length squared of the random walk in, the, in, the, in some norm, and now you wanna see how it's related to the uh, expected norm squared of the increments of the random walk, right? Does that make sense? If, if it's a Euclidean norm, this is just the equality, right? You open up the square, cross terms cancel. Right. The, the claim is that this is a, the, the inequality that corresponds to smoothness, right? Once you've got smoothness, you can define strong convexity, then from strong convexity you define the uh, the the, the diver uh, uh, Bregman divergence, you define uh, mirror descent. Okay, so what is the B function? It's a function of two statistics, right? Clear that you need, right? This, the, the B function is just a function of two statistics. One is the sum of the x's and the other one is the sum of the squares, right? And once you write it like that, it's clear that what we want is expected B less than zero, right? Here. So what we want is expected b less than zero. What is this function that, that certifies this? Well, it exists because we know that if, if the norm is smooth, you can prove the inequality. So if, if you can prove the inequality, then, uh, uh, um, then this u star exists. So uh, one more thing is that u star inherits this property that uh, u star of x, and this is a constant, alpha squared, is just u star of x zero minus k alpha squared. You can just check it from the definition. And uh, uh, you can also check that the third property can be written in a slightly nicer form as this inequality, okay? So you just have to search over these functions, over functions that satisfy the first two inequalities and this inequality. You can, you can run over the space of all uh, functions. And as a corollary of this observation and this observation, you see that, or you can show, uh, I can show it in the next slide, that the, the function x to um, u star of x zero is a universal smooth function with respect to the norm, right? So you give me a norm, this will be the smooth function that you can construct, and its dual is strongly convex, right? So you give L infinity norm, L1 norm, I can construct a, a smooth function just from this u star. And this universal construction is actually, goes back to PZR uh, a long time ago. Karthik has it in his thesis, uh, written in a nice way. Um, but it actually, it's, it's much simpler. It's just a consequence of the third property. It's just a consequence of this third property, right? The, the interesting thing is that the, the, this existence of a smooth function follows from concavity, right? You can in, uh, treat this as a concavity property. Uh, of this optimal u star function. Okay. Maybe I don't have the time, but it, the proof is, is three lines. Um, uh, it's just by definition and by that observation. Sorry, yes. This function also has another property, right? That it's invariant under permutation of the arguments. Would you typically expect something like this? Um, I mean, this b. b yeah, this b, yes. Doesn't, the labeling of the x of y doesn't really matter. Um, uh, 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 so, so what is the question? That is, is it a property that you typically expect or that you can require without loss of generality that the... the for, mirror, for mirror descent, that will be the case somehow. Yeah, right? but in the previous <coughs> setting... But in the, uh, the play setting we want, it's n not because we have this random signs. You, you need more 
Let me go to the second example and maybe, maybe you see this. OK. OK, so example two is how to get this empirical Rademacher as, as the regret bound. Sorry to, to interrupt. Yeah. If, if you put DL1 norm, for example, what is the strong convexity that it pulls out? So if, uh, well, it, it, it's, it's that definition. Uh, your question is, is it entropy or is it, uh, or is it the LP norm with P close to one? No, we don't, I, they're all equivalent to a, up to a constant, right? So you, I don't think you can just say that this is that function. It's a function and it's equivalent to all other functions, but it's a universal construction. Okay, so um, now uh, there's this three part connection, right? So. We, we need to uh, take at the, uh, we, we need to look at the online problem, look at its dual, the minimax dual, to understand what kind of martingale inequality we need to, to prove. And the martingale inequality that comes up is this one. I, I'm skipping something, the, the one that comes up is with p equal to one, but we need to uh, take it with p larger than one, but that, that's a minor, minor issue. So let me explain what this is. This is exactly the, uh, the original dyadic martingale, right? I, I said that it can be always written as epsilon t times the predictable function of the past, right? And now what you're asking is, can I decouple? Can I take the epsilon t's and just decouple them, ma ma uh, draw an independent sequence of epsilons, keep the xt's measurable with respect to the original uh, sequence of epsilons, but these epsilon t's are uh, uh, um, uh, are decoupled, right? So that's called the decoupling inequality. And it's not clear that the, such an inequality would hold. But that's the martingale inequality that we need to, to establish. Um, there is a, if you actually require a two-sided version of this, so that there is also lower bound in terms of that, this is known to be equivalent to what's called the deterministic uh, uh, property. And the only difference is that the uh, it has to hold for all sequences of coin flips. And I know that I'm going very fast here, but this is the inequality, in fact, that we're going to be using. It's, it, again, it's a martingale inequality. XTs are now the dyadic martingales, and these are fixed uh, uh, signs. And um, it's e easy to write down the B function for that, and you see that it has to keep these statistics, right? These are statistics that are not kept by the uh, mirror descent or gradient descent. And once you keep these statistics, that's the B function. There exists a, a, a U function, and sometimes we can compute it, sometimes we cannot compute it. It's neither convex nor concave. Uh, the third property translates into the following property, which is called zigzag concavity in the literature, and that's an example of this U function. And now we can go back, as I promised, go back from the geometry as given by this U function go back to uh, online prediction and define a prediction method that attains the, uh, the Rademacher bound. Okay. How do we do it? Um, well, we, uh, we linearize the problem. This is a, just a minor step. Uh, this is the inequality that we want to prove without the P, but okay, so, so let me skip this, uh, this step. Uh, that's upper bounded by the uh, by the first property, because this is the B function, right? So the B function is upper bounded by the U function. And so this is the potential th that we're gonna be using in our recursion uh, for on the online prediction problem. And solving this recursion at the last step tells you what to do at the previous steps as well in terms of prediction. And you're just taking a gradient of the of U function at zero as, as your prediction. And if that's the case, uh, uh, there is a clean uh, recursion that happens, and you essentially obtain the uh, regret bound with the Rademacher. Okay. So if you can get a handle on this U function, you've got the result, right? So, so it's not just the existence proof. If you've got this U function, that's the one you should be using to obtain the, the, the result, just the same way that you would be using strong convexity if you thought that the mirror descent is what you want. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, I think there is a very interesting set of connections that uh, can be exploited. Uh, I talked about the connection between geometric properties uh, of, of the space or the, the properties of this uh, function promised by the Perkholder method uh, and the connection to martingale inequalities. But the online learning or online optimization plays a crucial role here because we understand what inequalities to get by looking at the dual of this problem. 
Okay, so just conclusion. Gradient descent, mirror descent does not keep the right statistics about the sequence. Uh, and and the, the geometric primitive of a strong convexity or smoothness is not enough. And, and so we can get the right result by exploiting connections between probabilistic inequalities and uh, geometry. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. So with the strong convexity and smoothness result that you had, uh, I wonder, so there's one of the special cases where the, these are independent zero mean variables, and that becomes an Emirovsky's inequality. Yes, yes, yes. So can you use that vector? But Nemirovsky inequality proves, uh, works as is with Martingale differences. You don't need the uh, independence, so, right? Okay, so that's basically proof for the generalized So it, it says that if the norm is smooth, and now you do mirror descent, then you can prove that Nemirovsky inequality, right? So that, that's one of the directions, right? The interesting direction is, is actually the, well, I mean, that's also an interesting direction, but it's that reverse, that if you could prove it, then there must exist the strongly convex function, right? If and only if. Yes. So one of the motivations was matrix completion. Yes. Right. Do, do you have a working example that you can actually? So we're, we're trying to search. Uh, we're trying to uh, get Pablo to find us this u function for the spectral norm. Yeah, and that's. Pablo, please give us u. Uh, and he hasn't given it yet. And he hasn't given it yet. <laughs> you got to get rid of the middleman. Well, the kind of the, the the immediate thing to do to try is to to just try SOS and try to find it, right? Like approximate. But we don't need the optimal one, right? We just need a function that satisfies these properties, which you can all encode as SOS, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I kind of sense of this picture that you were drawing. So this is general connection between major uh, Martingale inequalities and uh, relation x. So similarly, that means that if you know that this Martingale inequality holds, like for this uh, convex, uh, like this. Uh, yes. 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 Then you, you know you get an algorithm for doing the online prediction. Um, you don't get an algorithm ex immediately. You you get the uh, a certificate that it exists. And so, so somehow, like this U thing, is a way to make this algorithm more explicit. Exactly. Exactly. That, exactly. And it somehow would want this U to be computable efficiently. Exactly. 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 That's so, right. so that's the something that here. If this U can be computed efficiently, then yeah. exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you.